Waves Radio. Initializing now. Man, you know, I think I picked the wrong week to have laryngitis, or I don't know, my voice doesn't seem right. Hey, everybody, I'm Michael Hinman, direct from New York City. How are you all doing? Long time no talk. Where do we leave off? <laughs> so, welcome back to Alpha Waves Radio. You're probably wondering, where the hell have we been? Um, it's been five years, I think, since the last time we actually had an Alpha Waves Radio show. And it, it's been way too long. And, I, you know, I, and I'm sorry about that. I mean, it's the industry has changed so much. When I talk about the industry, I'm talking about the media industry. And, uh, I mean, this past August, by the way, uh, the site still exists, but it hasn't been updated in a long time. But this past August was the 20th anniversary of of Airlock Alpha, which was my news site for a long time, originally Sci-Fi Portal. Um, and yeah, it, it's just it's it was so surreal just to think about the fact that like I'm 42 now. <laughs> you know, it's barely illegal to drink when I started the site, and now I'm like an old man, and here I am. St- Still doing the internet thing. Um, and now with the voice is not fully here. So my first show back and my voice is just bleh. <laughs> so I really am sorry about that. So where have I been? So, I mean, the biggest thing that you should know is that because the industry changed so much, uh, I, I really kind of stopped being involved with Airlock Alpha. We kind of stopped updating it. And, and the biggest reason for that is that, that we got to that point where we were getting so much traffic but not enough to uh, to get enough advertising to pay for how much it costs to host the site, it, it's 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 kind of a weird balance that, that there's this big dead zone <laughs> like where you can have a lot of traffic like so much where you have to have dedicated servers, but but just it, it just wasn't working right you know where you just couldn't monetize it because really everything that's happening on the internet now is going to video, which is why I'm doing audio. <laughs> because I have to go against the stream. I always, I can never do what everybody else is doing. I have to do my own thing. So while everybody else is doing video, and they all look great for video and everything else, but I don't. I, I, I really have a face for radio. And if you've ever seen me, you would know that that is certainly true. And right now, it sounds like I have a voice just to stay in newspaper. But uh, so for the past five years, um, I, if you remember the old Alpha Ways radio show, we always hosted it from Florida unless we were traveling somewhere. But um, I, I lived in Florida for 20 years, uh, the Tampa Bay area, for anybody who's from that part. And, um, and, and so what happened, though, was that I ended up becoming, I guess, a foreign traveler <laughs> for a couple of years. Um, I actually moved to the Caribbean. One of the things that I always said was that um, I was going to retire to the Caribbean by the time I was 40. So I had an opportunity to live in Grenada for a couple of years. Uh, Grenada, by the way, is a small Caribbean island that's at the very like southern end of the Caribbean. So like you'd almost have to go to Venezuela. <laughs> I mean, we were so close to the equator that literally our days were 12 hours. And I spent almost two years there. And, and it was great. It was a fantastic experience. I, I had a chance to kind of relax and take a break because I'm a workaholic and I never seem to take breaks. And it was it was just a great experience. Um, and then after two years there, I moved to New York City. And I've been in New York now for probably 18, 19 months. Uh, I lived in Brooklyn for the first year, but now I'm in the Bronx because uh, that's where my job has been the whole time. I was commuting a long time. And uh, now I actually get to live a little bit closer to work. So um, I'm working in newspapers. I am an editor of a, of a newspaper in the Bronx, actually, and, and it's been a blast. Um, yet, I still wanted to come back. I would come, I would just do various podcasts once in a while and, and realize how much I missed 
talking to everybody and, and sharing my thoughts and everything that's happening in the world of, of movies, television, and everything, because you know me, I always have an opinion. <laughs> Whether it be the Marvel Universe, the DC Universe, what's happening in Star Trek, what's happening with the Star Wars franchise, um, I mean, and really just like everything in between. And I, I just wanted to have that platform again. So it was a it was a really interesting opportunity where uh, Russ Haslidge, who uh, is the leader of a uh, Star Trek fan group actually known as the Federation, they own Trek United, which by itself is its own thing. Um, if you want to hear, by the way, more about Trek United and all of that stuff, become a member on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash alphawavesradio. We have like a special show there where you can hear all about um, the whole Trek United thing and the failed uh, convention that they put together that was just a disaster that like totally imploded on itself. Uh, we had like a show that we did right after the implosion with a number of guests that were actually at this convention. So if you want, go to our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash Radio, And really, you should go there anyway, because that's the new model of our show is that because you are going to hear advertising on this if you're listening to us on Odyssey One, which is what I think the network's being called. I mean, we're Trek United Radio, but now I think we're going to be called Odyssey One um, or something like that. It's it's exciting, actually. I think that they're they're trying to finalize all the branding and everything, so I hope I didn't let the cat out of the bag. Um, so I apologize if that is the case. But yeah, that was supposed to be the thing that we're supposed to have. Um, so if you're listening to us on Tuesday night, so you're listening to us either on Trek United Radio or Odyssey One or whatever it might be called at the moment. Um, but you can listen to the show ahead of time. Not this week because this show got put together the night before. But, <laughs> it's, but, um, but if you can become a member of our site, it's you know very affordable. Um, everything from... Uh, having a chance to to hear archive versions of the show, uh, to actually hearing the show early, you know, you don't have to wait till Tuesday. You can actually listen to it over the weekend if we get the show done, and, and some other great perks too. And, and we hope that you really take advantage of that because putting together the show, it's not it's an hour long show. But really, each show probably takes three to four hours to put together. Um, this one took five or six, and that's a lot of time. And when you're doing that every single week. That that's one of those things that it's just it's it's hard to keep going with that with everything else that happens and you know I live in New York City now it's very expensive so I, I wanted to find ways that that allowed the the show to to generate at least some revenue without it being a burden on anybody so I hope that you'll have a chance to, to take a look there's all kinds of levels we'd love for you to be a member of any one of those levels it's at patreon.com slash alpha waves radio and and tonight our first show back um, after five years, this was a guest that I actually wanted to have. I guess, oh man, I mean, I, I think we actually had him scheduled for Alpha Waves Radio before we kind of went off the air. Um, but if you remember, it's been about 12, 13 years now, uh, before J.J. Abrams came on board to do the Star Trek movies, and after Star Trek Nemesis bombed, and after Star Trek Enterprise was canceled, the, the Paramount had this big announcement that they were going to uh, bring back the Star Trek uh, movie franchise. They're going to reboot it, basically. Um, going, you know, do some kind of prequel thing. You get away from the Next Generation movies. Let's go pre-Kirk. They brought in a, a writer named Eric Jenderson. And at the time, uh, Eric was primarily known for his work on HBO's Band of Brothers, which he actually won an Emmy for. And that was a series that I believe he co-created with Tom Hanks. Um, and, I mean, this was like a one of HBO's big shows that they had, especially at the time. And I think even today, uh, you know, people still talk about Band of Brothers. It was an absolutely fantastic series. And Eric is just, I mean, he's just, it was interesting. I, I remember when they first announced it and they said, you know, that he doesn't even know anything about Star Trek, that I was like totally against it. I think I spoke out pretty heavily and and I had nothing to do with it. I wanted absolutely nothing to do with, with what Eric Jenderson was doing. Um, but then I guess he read that <laughs> he, on Sci-Fi Portal would have been at the time that he read that, wrote me an email and uh, we've kept the dialogue ever since. And I, and I have to say that Eric is a fantastic person. Um, I had a chance to read the script at one point, which I think everybody did because I think it leaked. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was running a spoiler site at the time, so it was easy for me to get scripts. So, but I think that that script actually got out a little bit publicly. And it's fantastic. And 
um, in er, you know Eric in our interview, he's going to tell you a lot about that. Uh, just one thing to note, just about the interview, it's a little bit long because I I, fe I feel that this is one of those chapters in Star Trek that hasn't really been talked about very much, and so. Um, and Eric hasn't really talked about this. This is really the first time in 13 years that he's talked about this in such depth. And he's doing it with us. So it's very exciting. Um, you know, as you know, you know that, that movie ended up not happening. And he'll talk about why that didn't happen, why J.J. Abrams came in, and and why the whole Star Trek franchise took a whole different direction. Um, and we're still getting our sea legs. So in, in this interview, unfortunately, I guess I wasn't monitoring my sound very well. I was so busy monitoring Eric's that I wasn't monitoring mine. So in the interview, I'm a little bit soft. Um, hopefully in future shows, we'll take care of that. I know a lot of podcasts, they don't care. They'll just do crappy sound quality and everything else. I'm not one of those people. I mean, I'm upset that my voice is cracking a little bit. <laughs> and so I'm kind of a perfectionist. But um, so my audio is a little bit light. Um, it might take a little bit getting used to that. So I do apologize in advance. But I hope you enjoy Eric Jenderson here on Alpha Waves Radio. start off just very simply you know very um i i guess because writers tend to be in the background you, you know they're not always the people that especially when we think about hollywood when we think about uh you know when we think about television when we think about movies we don't really always think about the writers which is sad because they're the ones creating the words but um you know, just tell us a little bit about you like, you know what what is some of your work where where, where would people know you from where would they, if they were paying attention to credits where would they see you uh, well, principally, probably um, identifiable with with Band of Brothers and HBO, which I co-created with with Tom Hanks back starting in oh gosh, it would have been beginning in '98. We started working on that show, and uh, it, it was really sort of left up to me for a, quite a while to do the research and to craft the series bible for that. And then subsequently, I was lead writer and supervising producer for for the miniseries and that's probably what i'm best known for uh certainly at the moment and and it was shortly thereafter that uh, that this kind of anomalous thing happened <laughs> with with star trek and that whole world yeah because that came out of nowhere i mean at least for fans i, I don't even think fans were expecting you know it expecting did. a film at that point and then all of a sudden it was there and all of a sudden, you know, there were these people involved that I, I don't think even that a lot of us didn't recognize the names for. And, and, right. and, and you were suddenly right in the middle of this. That, that had to be a little bit jarring because that was because you know, you're, you're jumping into, into, you know, something that's totally different from, you know, from the great work, you know, of Band of Brothers you know, and, and looking at that aspect. But now you're coming into like this real fiction, this real science fiction, really, that's just this rabid fan base that must have been. Correct. It, it, yeah, and and if I was at all a hero in this story, which I, is still up for grabs, I was a reluctant <laughs> hero because um, it did come out come out of nowhere. I was called by my agent and told that the this producer Jordan Kerner um, wanted to talk to me about a project, and uh, he and I think it was Kerry McCluggage um, called me up and and they they asked me if I would be interested in writing a prequel to star trek it was just that bald and i said no because, <laughs> right answer but, probably right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean f fundamentally because uh, my sort of problem is i i in general it sounds kind of obnoxious to say this because it's such a sweeping generalization but i don't like science fiction i don't like most science fiction for me always it had been jules verne Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Wells, Arthur Conan Doyle. That was science fiction, as far as I was concerned, the stuff that they had done. And, yeah. and a more modern science fiction was something that, as a genre, I had never really cared to or cottoned to as a, as a kid. Um, and I had watched Star Trek uh, in reruns. I'm not that old. Uh, but I, and I, so I was very familiar with, with you know the show, the original series, and... And I was very honest with them. I said, look, I'm, I'm really not interested. I, I'm not really a fan of the show. There are only two aspects of the show that I really found fascinating and captivating. One was that it was socially relevant. 
the episodes were they were about something. They were about something political or social that was going on at the time. They were they were really true, truly reflective of socioeconomic dynamics, racial dynamics, all of that stuff, which I thought was extraordinary, actually. And two, the character of James T. Kirk, who I found just hilarious, but kind of captivating in a sort of Horatio Hornblower way, you know, <laughs> this sort of bombastic uh, commanding officer who I, I just, I, I found him vastly entertaining. But other than that, as a, as a genre, to come to me to, to write something like that, I just said, I, I'm sorry, guys, but I, I really have to say no. And yeah, especially they, if it's a project. Yeah, especially if it's a project that um, you're not even writing about Kirk. If that was if that was one of the highlights for you, and it obviously right. it wasn't even going to involve that character at all. Exactly, and you know, I, I also understood the the Roddenberry ethos too, which I'll, I'll come back to later, and 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 really respected it. But it, it just wasn't something for me. I didn't feel uh, sort of prima facie that I could I could serve the canon. Uh, so I simply said no. And for some reason that to this day, I don't understand, they persisted. They kept on coming back to me. And it was literally like on the third call that I got from these guys that I said, all right, look, let me go off and let me think about a story that I would like to tell. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get back to you. And I, I literally thought, well, I'm going to cook up something that they'll never do. <laughs> And so I kind of, I, I did a little research. I sort of looked at the, the entire canon. I mean, not exhaustively, but I familiarized myself with it. And I realized something that was, that was fascinating to me, that the canon at that time was sort of like an encyclopedia botanica that was missing the letter G. There was this, er, there was this early incident that was fundamental to the story, to the entire canon, to the entire mythology of the show that was referenced constantly, but had never been shown, which was the Earth Romulan War, you know, the sort of inciting incident for Starfleet and all of that stuff. So, I thought, well, that's interesting, you know, that the one thing Roddenberry avoided, and that all the other shows had avoided, was looking at that inciting incident, what really happened to kick this whole thing off. And then I thought, well, that, that could be an interesting story. And then I sort of looked at the timeline and considered the idea of creating a progenitor to Kirk, who could be the hero. But I also realized that it's a war story. And that is sort of antithetical to the Roddenberry ethos. But so I thought, I'm in great shape. I'm going to tell them a story that they'll never make. <laughs> and, and, and my, my original know? premise was that it was a trilogy, that the, the first one was uh, um, going to be sort of, I guess, it, it, to some extent, it was a little bit like the Iliad. The, the sequel was going to be a, a little bit similar to the Odyssey, and the third one, I had no idea <laughs> what it was going to be. You're just going to get there when you get there, basically. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, they, they called me back at the uh, appropriate time, and I told them this story about uh, when the Romulans are on a essentially an ethnic cleansing campaign throughout the galaxy to rid the galaxy of their cousins. And, uh, and, and at the time, the, the Bosnian War was going on. So there was sort of a nice uh, parallel to the, you know, Bosnia, Croatia, what was happening, all that ethnic cleansing nightmare that was going on with Milosevic at the time. And that got you and, right into that social, that social relevance, that, that, which is one of precisely. the elements you liked. Yeah. Right, right, because it had to be about something. And so, you know, I told him the story about this small Vulcan co colony in Sausalito, which is where I happened to live <laughs> at the time. And, um, you know, and there's this invasion. It's like Pearl Harbor. And um, there, I told the details of how the Romulans arrive and surround the planet and essentially demand that the humans turn the Vulcans over to them. And it's a tiny colony. Yeah. And, you know, with, faced with this overwhelming force, we say no, and the war begins, and and it went on from there, and really tells a story about this one intrepid man and his this ragtag crew that he puts together in this experimental ship uh, off of Saturn, and the idea being, if at the beginning of World War II, for instance, some band of brothers had 
gone off to Berlin and, you know, destroyed it and killed Hitler, the whole thing would have ended spontaneously. And that was the idea to get, get these guys to Romulus and to try to stop stop a, a war that was impossible for the for the earth to win yeah to go right to the and, heart of the right go to the right to the heart of the enemy basically and just cut it out before right. it has a chance to really grow exactly so it's an impossible mission <laughs> clearly and it's certainly in the spirit of of the canon you know that kind of uh it, it, it just in, an impossible an impossible task an impossible goal and then uh, in, in pitching the sequel, it was really about them finding themselves. Them not know, they're out of touch with Earth. They don't know if they've been successful or not. And they have to make their way all the way back to Earth, actually on a, a crippled Romulan ship, and, um, because theirs have been destroyed, and not knowing if the Earth even exists anymore. So it's more like uh, the Odyssey going home and the experiences and adventures that they have trying to get home not knowing whether it's, it's even there or not. So anyway, I, I pitched this whole thing and they listened and they said, can you come down here and, and present this to um, Donald DeLine at, at Paramount? I said, well, sh- uh, sure. And so I did, I went down and, and uh, they told me ahead of time, it was, it was really just Jordan and Carrie. And I can't remember if Rick was there or not because Berman was really only attached to this in name. He didn't have any, we didn't have any intercourse around the, the, the project creatively or anything. So this was actually when he was, you know, because I mean, we know he, he, you know, he left before JJ Abrams came on board, but he was really on his way out even before then. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and I was told ahead of time that DeLine never bought anything in the room and he was sort of zero affect kind of, uh, ex- executive. So I said, fine, because I, I would, really wasn't that invested in doing this. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, so really, went this up is, there so there's and, like no pressure really for you at all. Then just going none, into this, none whatsoever. But then it got worse because I, I commenced to, I, I actually started the entire pitch with, I hate science fiction. That's the first <laughs> That's thing I great, said. And, that had to be a great start right there. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly got everybody's attention. I, bet I said did. that's it. I told them what I did like about about you know the the, the franchise, um, and then just jumped into it. And, and it was one of the strangest experiences I've ever had in Hollywood. Um, it was like pitching in a sensory deprivation tank. There was no energy in the room. Wow. I mean, it was complete and total silence. It was like pitching in space. Where no one can hear you scream, <laughs> um, and uh, it was just so odd, and it started to annoy me because usually, sort of energetically, you can get a sense of your audience, you know. And so, as I kept on telling the story, I got more and more annoyed, and I just uh, decided to just—I'm going to tell them the whole movie, and I told them the whole film. Got to the unusual, end. Is that unusual to do that kind of in a pitch yeah. session? Yeah, it is. It is I mean, to, in, in that kind of detail. Yeah. And a lot of it I was sort of making up on the fly as well. And I got to the end and, uh, and Mr. DeLine said, uh, how fast can you write this? <laughs> and I made some kind of wisecrack about next Tuesday. Oh, and then no. So said, no, really. I mean, I said it would require some, some, some deep research and then it would, you know, take whatever it is, yeah. 12 weeks. And he stuck his hand out toward mine and said and shook my hand and said write it fast and we we left the room got down to the lawn at paramount there and these guys were going nuts it's like you're writing the next star trek movie and i thought oh my god i'm writing the next star trek movie <laughs> and i never really intended to and then i i went home and i uh started to do some i took a really de- a real deep dive into the canon for one particular reason, because I had suddenly realized something that was kind of critical, that maybe the best person to do something like this is some one who's not a fan, because that gets in the way. It does sometimes. That's so true. And, and I also realized I related the, the, the fan, fandom and, the, and the, the, the people who revere these stories so much to my own childhood, and I felt that way about something which was Conan Doyle's story, Sherlock Holmes canon. And I've never seen anybody write anything that I, that lived up to my expectations. And I thought, I've got to treat this 
you know, as, as though I, I have to have a respect and understanding of the fans uh, and what they would want to see and to not be sloppy about this and take full responsibility to make sure that this thing is outstanding and write it for them, but not as a fanboy, you know, to do what I've always wanted some writer to do if they're approaching a, a writing some, creating some new Sherlock Holmes story. Hey, don't go away. We're going to have more with Eric Jenderson right after these messages. And he also gave me 50 bucks to say it. Michael Hinman is back on Alpha Wave Radio. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Dan Taylor. Let's get back to our interview now with one-time Star Trek film writer, Eric Jenderson. It's, it's Go ahead. exciting. You know, it's exciting, but at the same time, you know, it's also something that might make a fan panic. Because all of a sudden, you know, they feel like, oh, no, now there's somebody who doesn't even know... Star Trek, they don't even like right. it, and now they're writing, so they're going to do a terrible job. Right. I mean, it's that's automatically what people think, but that's not always true. It's actually almost the opposite. At least yeah. it was in my case, because I became so hyper responsible. <laughs> so yeah. I, you know, I watched everything I could, I read everything I could, I really familiarized myself with the timelines and uh, every aspect of. It. I think at the end of the day, I only actually made one mistake in the first draft of the script that somebody caught, and it was really minor. But it was an interesting timeline because it's set in, I think, if I remember right, it was like 2059. 20, no, 2159. Yeah, yeah, 20. uh, I think is when it was set. And um, and placing that accurately, you know, in, into the into the politics of the canon, into all the different iterations of timelines. And so I found, I think, just the right exact place to, to you know, to, to set the thing. And then I had to sort of look around the canon and acknowledge what was happening simultaneously and what had already been done because enterprise, the world of enterprise still was existing at, you know, overlapping at that time. And I, so I think I just went sort of beyond the pale in making sure that I didn't make any mistakes along that line. And then I essentially wrote the movie that I wanted to write. Um, and, and it very, very much was a, a war film, an invasion film. And, uh, and I, it, after the research, I wrote it fairly quickly, and I turned it in on a Tuesday, as I recall, and on the Thursday of that week, uh, Donald DeLine was fired. Oh, no. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I suddenly, I realized two things. One, that's why he'd asked me to write it fast, <laughs> because he really wanted to be able to green light it, because yeah. he could see his own demise. He knew the writing but was he on was, the wall, yeah. Yeah, he but he didn't expect it to happen as quickly as it did. Uh, I th I don't think. Mm -hmm. And what happens in Hollywood, and it does sort of make sense. It's tragic, but whenever there's regime change at a studio or a network, the incoming executive or president is essentially you know wipes the shelf clean. It's a tabula rasa because they they very rarely will pursue developing something that their predecessor had developed. Because if it's a success, they can't really take credit for it. And if it's a failure, then they look like idiots. Yeah. So sort of no matter what the project is, it's a clean, it's a, it's a clean slate. Everything is, is just swept off the table. And so it, actually very few people even ever you know, read the script because it had all, all happened almost simultaneously. And um, I think it was Ain't It Cool News somehow got a hold of a copy of the script and – they wrote up a sort of a precy or a, 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 a summary 
of of the story and published it online and and somehow it ended up on memory alpha <laughs> as a result of all that so then there were there are aspects of the story that sort of i guess still bubble up to the surface from time to time about that particular tale yeah, because I think that you know, when people, but, would, you know, and I, and I remember when Anacle News came out with, you know, with the summary and, st- and such, and, you know, and they were, and, and fans were seeing this and, and, and reading what this was, and I remember, you know, reading this summary, and, I mean, it, it, I think it was a fascinating story, and, you know, and, and it's really sad because this is a project that, you know, that, that essentially died simply because of studio politics, not because of anything to do with the story itself, and, you know, and it became right. kind of a victim of that. Yeah, I mean, we never got. To, uh, there was never a second draft done. You know, it was just literally that first draft delivered at the on the same week that that the hierarchy left, and then um, mm-hmm. Gail Berman came in as president, and essentially, I think, decided that they were going to end the franchise and not pursue a franchise at all. And then oh, wow. JJ stepped up with his idea, and uh, an interesting, <laughs> really interesting epilogue to the whole story is. That you know, JJ and, and and Kurtzman and Orsi were off making their movie, and it was getting close to the release date. And I suddenly got this certified letter in the mail from the WGA, and they w- were taking action against, I guess it was Bad Robot, to um, delay the release of the film because they had determined that I hadn't been in the chain of title, which when it was submitted to the WGA, as the, you know, the chain of writing title. Yeah, yeah. And I, so I called the WGA and I said, look, guys, I really appreciate this, but I don't think what JJ is doing has anything to do with, with my story. I think it's, you know, 200 years off or, you know, or at least a hundred years off. It's in a completely different time frame. Yeah, uh, and they yeah, said, well, you'll nevertheless, you were from a studio standpoint. I said, look, have Orsi or Kurtzman call me. And just tell me what they've done. And so they did. I got a call from Bob. And he said that he, you know, he heard about my script, but he never read it. And then he proceeded to tell me the entire story of their first Star Trek film over the phone. He pitched the entire thing to me. And I said, wow, the only thing that, that, that you know, is there's no similarity whatsoever, except for the fact that there, there were aspects to it that fit right into some of the decisions I'd made in my prequel you know, yeah. which was really kind of cool and incidental. So I called WGA back and, and the legal counsel, and I said, you know, please cease and desist. This has nothing to do with me. I'm not in the chain of title. This is an original piece, and and that was it. I mean, is that odd for a writer to do sometimes? Because especially with something that's high profile like that, you know, where a writer might have – because, I mean, we used to see – I don't know how much you've ever read, like, what Leonard Nimoy wrote, but I remember he had a story that he said in one of his books back, um, I think, when they were doing Star Trek VI, where, um, like, a couple of guys showed up. They, they took some notes while, um, like, Nicholas Meyer and Leonard Nimoy were talking story – and then, you know, they, they wrote down some of the notes of what they were talking about, and then they took off and never heard from them again. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> that was a bad time. Um, and, and that they, <laughs> but that, you know, but that, that, then, that suddenly they came back later, you know, it was a WGA uh, action where those guys had right. had their names added to it. And, and you know, Leonard right. Nemo said, those guys had nothing to do with this. I mean, so you almost, I mean, it seems like you almost could have you know, easily put your name to this, but said, no, I'm not doing that. Well, yeah, but I mean, it, it would not have been uh, uh, the right thing to do in the least. And, you know, I serve on, uh, back then I was doing it frequently uh, as a consultant for the arbitration committee at the WGA East. So I'm very familiar about how arbitrations work and how, you know, credit is determined. And uh, while I guess, you know, somebody could attempt that argument, it's really specious because, I mean, I was writing something that was set in a different century than theirs. And, you know, I just it would have been an ugly and ridiculous thing to do. And it wasn't right anyway. we don't we don't want to encourage that kind of behavior in Hollywood. Yeah. There's nothing that has there. <laughs> that's what I mean. That's what's that's, that's what's nice to see that you know that there are you know that there definitely are writers out there who who won't who won't do that. Even though know, they'll take that right the the right way to go and not just like oh I'm gonna put my name on this if I have a chance to do it and you know and if the WGA is already going after why not? But I like that that you said no. You know let me hear what it is and let's see if there's anything they they took and they and no I'm. 
I like that. I think that's just a I don't know, honest thing to do. <laughs> it's right. just, but let me right. circle let me circle back just real quick because you said something mm-hmm. I don't know if I even heard this before unless you know I mean it's been it's been a while so maybe you know just you know I'm old now um but you know but you said that when Gail Berman came in at least from what you understood that there was actually discussion of just stopping the franchise completely that it wasn't that they That's just went I to JJ Abrams yeah. that that they were actually no. thinking about stopping and then JJ kind of stepped in and said hey let, let me try something that's that's the way I heard it. I don't know if it's true or not. The way, but that's the way I heard it. And, and yeah. that JJ kind of reached out to to Paramount, and while they're in the middle of or had decided pretty much to let's not pursue this for a while, um, you know, we're just gonna we're just gonna stop the it, the franchise. Yeah, the franchise was suffering quite a bit at that point. I mean, where yeah. I mean, Enterprise had just been canceled because um, I think it was canceled even before uh, you were writing the, you know, when you were writing your script. And I mean, Star Trek a Nemesis was a disaster. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it, was a, it was a bomb at the box office, an absolute disaster. Um, and it just seemed like it, that, 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 that it dried up. And um, so it's probably understandable that Paramount would say like, you know, maybe it's time to take a breather from this, but. Yeah. Yeah. It made sense. And, you know, JJ just came in and sort of, he, he was, I think, responsible for revitalizing the whole thing with all of his energy and Kurtzman and Orsi's work. So you, everything changed. Yeah. I mean, is it, you know, and I know that, I mean, obviously, especially, you know, writing for Hollywood, that there's a lot of times that you're going to pitch things or even write full scripts and stuff that may never see the light of day. But does it kind of bug you sometimes knowing that, that there is a script that at least, the people who have who have heard about it, who have heard the story, and, and they seem to really like it, it, does it kind of bug you sometimes knowing that that's sitting on a shelf somewhere just collecting dust? Yeah, of course it does. I mean, and, and, and all writers uh, in Hollywood, um, working in Hollywood, you know, have a sock drawer filled with very usually very honed scripts. Often they've been through, you know, multiple drafts and all kinds of hopefully good development that a regime change or politics or whatever other reason for whatever other reason that has nothing to do with the merits of the work the, that the project didn't move forward, you know, and I think there are some enterprising sort of startup studios and production companies who are now really realizing that there's a surfeit of, of amazing work in sock drawers sort of all over the place. And that, that there, there would be incentivized to, pay the turnaround costs to the studios, which is essentially what, you know, what the studio had paid out to the writer at the time and any other expenses. And maybe to do it at, you know, 80 cents on the dollar to acquire the rights to be able to, to take those scripts out or, or make those, those scripts. And I think some people are starting to do that now. And it's, it's really high time um, because there's a lot of very valuable material in general, if a, no matter what the reason for the demise of a project in general, the agencies and attorneys for creative people aren't really incentivized to go through all of that hassle to get it away from the studio because it is sort of a pain in the ass. Yeah. So it's, it's generally looked at as like, let's do something fresh, you know, because even, even if it, uh, the, the end of a project, the demise of a project has nothing to do with its merits, it's still that, okay, well, it wasn't developed here or the word is out that, you know, there was something wrong with it, but there, often there, there's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes there is. Sometimes it just got awful. Um, which, I mean, it could be, but, you know, which could be fixed after acquisition sometimes. But sure. But for, for sure. something like this, though, it, it's really kind of hard to throw it and turn around because it's attached to a to a franchise that really, I mean, I guess two studios own it now, more or less, but that, you know, that it's not like, I mean, I guess they could probably take the story and change the characters, change, you know, the the basis of it being inside Star Trek, but other than that, it's mm-hmm. kind of hard for like, like Fox couldn't step in and, and grab this or, you know, Warner right. Brothers because I mean, it's a Star Trek product at the end. So, so really it's either Paramount makes it or, or it just sits there. Right. Or they decide to, you know, adapt it into, to use it for instance, as the pilot episode for a, a, a new television series, you know, there's, you can do it in different formats too. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, the, the only annoying thing about it really to me is because it just happens to all writers, happens to all writer producers in television, um, is that the story of the Earth Romulan War still hasn't been told. Yeah, <laughs> so 
you know, it's it's still out there to be told at some point. Well, have you ever thought about, I mean, especially now that, I mean, because, I mean, it's so weird because, and I don't even know, like, where your script kind of sits with this, because I, I, cause I think that you're doing all this either post-separation or, or, or before a Viacom split, I can't remember exactly the timeline now, but, you know, but now that your script is probably sitting with Paramount, um, which only owns movie rights right now to Star Trek, uh-huh. um, you know, where, right. where there's this, but then you have CBS that's like doing all of this, this uh, so active right now, especially mm-hmm. with their, you know, with their OTT service, you know, with CBS All Access. I mean, they just announced that they're doing an animated series with the Rick and Morty guys. And, you know, they're doing, you know, a, a whole series based on Captain Picard, you know, with Patrick Stewart, you know, playing him, right. you know, as an ancient uh, former captain. I mean, does that kind of make you sit back and say, "Hey, you know, if if you're if you're mining for for ideas, why not kind of go back and take a look at this?" I mean, do you think that if because you talked about it, like, "Oh, maybe this could be a pilot." I mean, could that could that concept that you developed, even though I know you were originally planning it as a trilogy, could that be turned into a television series? Oh, sure, it could. Of course, it could because it's a whole world. I mean, there are there are the progenitors of many characters. Spock's forebears are play a role in the storyline and certainly uh, Admiral Gardner's daughter. <laughs> and, and then the character that I uh, just reminded me of something too, because somebody sent me an email a while ago about, I didn't really look into it. It was about this animated series and they were telling me that they had co-opted the name chase for the main <laughs> character, which is the name of Tiberius chase in, in, in Star Trek, the beginning at least uh, Kirk's, I guess, great grandson, a uh, great grandfather. Grandfather, yeah, yeah. And he's he, he's our hero. And I thought it was really funny. I was like, where, where did you get that name? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, of course, anything's possible. Look, as far as I'm concerned, this is just one of the most extraordinary uh, canons of storytelling ever created. And you know, even with its failures, it's it's still compelling. And the you know the the encyclopedia gets just fatter and fatter and fatter, but ultimately somebody's going to go in and want to do that letter G, you know, and fill that fill that void, and and in any manner that they want to. I mean, there's film or television or who knows, but it would be it would be very gratifying to uh, to come back to it at some point and uh, and take part in it because I must say that by the time I was through the process. And I had delivered the script. I had turned myself into a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it has a way of doing that, I think, uh, sometimes. I, I think it does. I, I think it does. So, I, you know, I, at the beginning, I was sort of, oh, kind of cocky, and I don't really care for this. But <laughs> by the time I finished, finished and had done all the due diligence and tried to serve it as best I could, I became almost an acolyte. Wow, yeah. Would you would you be involved? If, let's say CBS was able to to get rights to to the script, and I, I think that some people might not realize that even though they've never produced it, I mean, it's not like you can go off and do it because I mean, no. Paramount still owns the the script, correct? Um, you yeah. know, and so like, would you be involved? I mean, Nicholas Meyer came back. You know, Alex Kurtzman came. You know, uh-huh. all over to the TV side. They're all part of Star Trek Discovery, and they're doing the work on these other uh, different television. If they said, you know what, we want to do the letter G. <laughs> we wanted mm-hmm. to get we want to get this Romulan war story in there, which I think would be mm-hmm. fantastic. I, I would be totally tuned into that. Um, do you think that is that something you would want to be involved with? Like, would your schedule even allow that? I mean, is that even something that you know? What twelve years later that you would even be interested in doing? I think even more than that, actually. Thirteen. Sure, years. sure, I would. I mean, yeah, and and I've sort of made my reputation in the town more in television than features. Um, you know, as, a, as a writer and showrunner. And so it would be a sort of a natural fit. And yeah, I mean, I really, I haven't thought about it much because, you know, it hasn't happened. But if something like that were to happen, I would, so I would certainly, I would certainly relish the opportunity to, to jump back into that world and to, and to, you know, be back in the, in the cockpit with some of these characters that I created back then out of whole cloth and, and really enjoyed the process. You know, I, I, um, yeah, it was a worthy project, and of course, I I'd, I'd consider that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it would take some, obviously some more development and, uh, you know, because there's a difference what? from, yeah, developing from a, for a movie and developing for an actual television series. And, I mean, right. do you think that because, even though it's been a while since that summary has really been out there, I mean, do you think that the fact that people know what that story is, even though it's only part one of what was supposed to be a trilogy, I mean, do you think that would ruin that for people or do you think that you could kind of play off of that? I mean, or is that something you really haven't thought about either because really, you know, nobody's coming. I haven't about thought it. about it. I mean, I think that the, the you know, uh, War is compelling, and the in the way in which it's ra- waged in this particular story is interesting, and uh, I think fairly unique, if not in the world of Star Trek. Otherwise, it, it and it's it deals with a lot of emerging technology from the canon, with regard to you know um, warp speeds and warp engines and all that kind of stuff, and and tactics and and such so there's a it's a a whole a a way of waging war on earth and off planet that's kind of fascinating and on the other end you have a uh, an ending to the sort of first iteration which was the first feature where you have this crew having to make their way back to earth and it can take as long as we want to be to to take it could be really the, the, the very first adventures of exploration, you know, in a sense, yeah, stopping off at planets and asteroids along the way home, and Taking the so it, it really yeah. it, it 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 could be it could be fascinating. It could be really fun. It, it it would definitely have the makings of its own standalone series. That's sort of like in the context of most Star Trek, it's like a period piece. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what, so if, if I mean, is that something then that? that if, if it ever happened, is that something you just have to wait for like the studios to say, Hey, let's do it. I mean, do you as a writer, could you kind of you know, using connections that you have, you know, working with studios, could you walk into CBS and say, Hey, I did a script over there. Let's, you know, have you guys thought of that? I mean, how does that even get approached? Right. I, I mean, it, at this point, I think <clears throat> the, I would prefer to, to see it come for, as, as a groundswell from the fans. I would rather see it come as, as sort of a, a to fill an, an, an express need. You know, if the fans of the of, of the, the canon and the franchise really want to see that, they can make that known. And you know, rather than it, it would be, it's better to respond to it to a need than to try to create a need. Um, yeah. So because yeah, yeah, because it, it just seems artificial. Otherwise, we say, hey, you know, I, I think this is what it is. But it's different if if the fans, but the fans have to be reminded of it sometimes too. I think because it's been a while. A lot yeah. has happened since. <laughs> since a lot has that. happened since. <laughs> in the Dude. world, in Star Trek, and everything. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a. Uh, but I mean, it would be really fascinating, I think, to see that, and especially you know, right now where there's so many, you know, so many avenues to to create these, you know, to create these stories to to tell them, and and I think that with with a studio enthusiastic about making them right now, I mean, have you seen any, uh, you know, anything since then, any of the Star Trek since then? Like, have you seen the JJ movies? I mean, did you check out Discovery at I've, all, or, or any of those things? I did. I haven't seen Discovery. I, I saw the JJ movies. I haven't seen Discovery. I hear good things about it, though. And, uh, yeah, but it's pretty good. Uh, no, I, I haven't. I mean, they do a Klingon I, war. They don't do the, They skip over the Romulan war too. They just, you know, jump into some Klingon conflict, you know, right before Kirk, basically. And um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but it, it's it's different. I mean, it's really nice to see. It once again, it takes that fresh blood. And it's really interesting because one of the people that's involved with with Discovery, at least in a producer standpoint, is Nicholas Meyer. Um, you know, who did Star Trek two and uh, Star of course. Trek six. And, yeah. and he was somebody who wasn't a fan. And that's why sometimes when fans say like, oh, we don't want to have people who aren't fans. I'm like, you know, the best Star Trek movies were done by a non-fan. So <laughs> it's kind of hard but, to. And, <laughs> to and he that. was, he was a Holmesian as well. He was a fan yeah. of Sherlock like Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's the key. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, maybe that's what it takes is to have that. Maybe that's the right, that's the right uh, background. To the have right combination. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I think it's where interesting stories come together and the Holmesian stories are, I mean, the reason why those still live and are so strong today is because, I mean, of, of, of how they were put together, of how unique they are, of, of the mm-hmm. characterizations. I mean, it had all the correct elements of, of what makes a good, compelling story. And that makes sense. You bet. And that's what you need here. So, you bet. And I think maybe with the 7% solution, Nicholas Meyer was the only one to my 
that, that really sort of reached my standards. If you're going to write a pastiche of, of that extraordinary canon, I think he probably is the only one who's done a really crackerjack job so far. And that was a long time ago, too. Yeah. Oh, my God, I have to leave it there. Eric Jenderson, thank you so much for coming on Alpha Waves Radio, for being our first guest our first guest um i hope you enjoyed that interview as much as i did eric is is he's so gracious with his time and i appreciate it he's a really busy guy um we are back every week that's right every week you're gonna hear alpha waves radio uh right now you can at least go to trekunitedradio.com or trekunited.com uh you can listen to us tuesday nights at seven eastern that's tuesday nights at seven eastern i'm sure they'll replay the show whenever they want but if you want to hear our shows early Come on and join us at patreon.com slash alpha waves radio. That's patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash alpha waves radio. Just a quick programming note uh, next week, uh, we're doing a little switching around because uh, we want to kind of keep this a little bit newsy. Uh, Carlos Pedraza, he is a journalist who works on a website called Axe Monitor. Actually, just got back from a convention uh, that's very specific to what his website covers. Um, it's about that whole Star Trek Axenar fan film thing. You might have heard about it, uh, where they raised like over a million dollars, never produced anything, and then got sued by CBS. Uh, we'll have all those details next week, but we are going to bring on Carlos next week instead of the week after. Uh, so next week is Carlos Pedraza. The week after, is Jack Kenny. He was the showrunner for Warehouse 13 and has uh, put together a great new short, an, an indie short that's making its rounds and getting some great critical acclaim. Uh, he's going to come on, talk about Warehouse 13 and what life has been like after that. So we have some great, exciting shows here coming up uh, for the rest of November. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> I, I can never forget Gary Morgenstein. Uh, he also will be here. Uh, Gary Morgenstein is the guy who used to work at Sci-Fi. Pretty much the guy that's responsible for that whole Sharknado thing. I don't think he created it, but I think he's the reason why Sharknado became the way it is. He's a good friend of mine, and uh, he will join us at the end of the month. So some great shows. Like I said, visit us at patreon.com slash alphawavesradio. And of course, one of the benefits of being a member of our Patreon page is that you have a chance to hear your name and a shout out. So our first shout out for our very first show goes out to Laura Greenbacker in Seattle. Thank you so much for being a member of our Patreon page, Laura. And thank you so much for listening. I'm Michael Hitman. See you soon. Executive producer of Alpha Waves Radio is Michael Hinman with co-executive producer Nathan Hasledge. And me? I'm Dan Taylor. Goodbye.